Hello everyone and I hope you're all doing very well. We have the pleasure of having with us our very own A10C weapons loader today. As usual you guys have given us the questions. We don't know what you've asked and we haven't vetted them but here they are. We're going to get through as many as we can. Uh, we probably won't get through 67 but we'll do the best we can so we the, the guy we've got is our friend loader he's been following us for ages on youtube and um really nice guy obviously uh, since, since the older days since we were very small and um, and we finally managed to get him on for an interview so mr loader can we hear a bit about yourself and a bit about the job description please absolutely sure uh so uh I'm a weapons loader. I'm a TW-171 aircraft armor system specialist. Uh, 23 years of uh, service with the Maryland Air National. Uh, I've deployed five times. Um, during one of those, or many of those deployments, uh, the most recent one, your videos helped us out a lot, helped me out a lot mm -hmm. as far as passing the time. Mm -hmm. So I thank you very much for that and thank all of the GR guys for that. And mm -hmm. also thank you for the interview. As far as my job description, I am uh, not just a weapons loader, but I'm also the weapons flight line supervisor. So I'm out there on the line pushing the load crews and making sure that we load uh, the tasking order or the flying schedule and meet all of our maintenance demands as well. Excellent. Right. Okay. And where did you say where you are based at the moment or we're not allowed to know that? We'll just call it the Maryland Air National Guard. Roger, that sounds good. Okay, well, let's crack on at the end. If we get to the end, there will be uh, an open fire where you guys can ask whatever you want. So, questions from the public. The things you mo things you like most about the A-10 weapons systems? That's an interesting question. That's such an open-ended question, but do you have an answer to it? I do. Uh, and the thing I like most about it is it's rugged. Um, when you're working on stuff and you have a fleet of 22 jets and you're trying to maintain them and keep the weapon systems all uh, all in the green, all good to go, it's helpful to have a rugged weapon system that you can send some not so talented people out there and they can bang on it a little bit and it will it will continue to function and the pilots can bang on it a lot and it will continue to function and it, it's it my favorite thing as a maintainer is that it's rugged and then as a person is that it's lethal in what it does mm -hmm. So I guess if you compare that to something like an F-16 or whatever, it's, it's going to be much you know, lightweight, less rugged, um, e more easier to damage, I suppose. Some of their components are, yes. Now, their bomb racks, the MAL-12s, same family as the MAL-4050s on the A-10. However, the rest of the aircraft, being a 9G aircraft and everything that goes on with it, they have all kinds of problems we don't have to. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay. Uh, let's go on to number two. If the A-10 is fully combat loaded but does not use any weapons in the mission, is it possible to bring them all back and land safely or is or do they need to jettison due to a weight limit? Negative. No jettison. They always bring them back. Any um, bursting tyres issues when you have that kind of thing? No, the only thing that will do that is um, is your brakes, if you have brake problems. Mm -hmm. the, so even a heavy i've seen a10s land hot and heavy on hot days on with a heavy loadout and they're okay as long as the pilot knows it. roger okay question three can you hot load the a10c and if so how quick is the turnaround time what does hot loading mean sorry i don't actually know they're talking about a hot load which means that we're going to be loading the jet while the pilot's still in the aircraft and the mm -hmm. engines are running uh, this is also called an ICT or an integrated combat turn, and it's something that we used to do a long time ago, and it's coming back. Mm -hmm. uh, the answer to this, even if I, I wouldn't say the exact numbers, but it all depends on how you're doing it and where you're doing it and with what kind of munitions. So there's uh, too many variables to tell you, because you could be on a taxiway refueling off of a C-130 while you're trying to load bombs from a trailer that's... Mm -hmm like 30 yards away or 300 yards away so it makes a huge difference mm. in like the the turn time mm. yeah makes sense there's a lot of variables in there to, to give a solid answer okay uh number four there were rumors stating that fat amy the f-35 was intended to replace the a-10 among other airframes wouldn't it be simpler to make a follow-up version of a flying gun with better modern materials and was you are just uh, told me i see that they're keeping the a-10 now or if i can if I just made that up in my mind, they are keeping the A10 till 2030. Roger, what are your thoughts yes, on that? Yes, he's right. Um, so I I talked with the SPO on this at the last conference I was at, and A10 is funded through 2030. Um, there's intentions to try to get it past that, especially with all the new wings that we're getting. And as far as quote unquote Fat Amy is concerned, that's not a rumor. That was the intention mm. was to replace all CAS and ground attack aircraft with. 
F-35. However, Congress stepped in with, I think it was the 2016 or 2017 National Defense Authorization Act and forbid the Air Force from um, spending any money to divest from the A-10 program. So the Air Force got stopped cold by um, by law. Mm, interesting. Okay. Uh, one thing I noticed was the huge cost differences between, for instance, an F-35 and an A-10. Now, these may not be relevant at this time, but I remember at some point the A-10 costs less costed less than a million dollars to buy um which i've always found amazing considering it is you know physically as much plane as any other plane um i just always found that very interesting as well well you're looking at dollars from 1970s versus dollars from the 2019s Mm -hmm. but there are big savings is coming it comes in terms of operating costs Mm -hmm. so an f-35 is between like 55 and 65 thousand dollars per flying hour i think for an f-35a and then the A-10 ranges in the nineteen to twenty-five thousand dollar flying hour. Mm-hmm. Roger, cool, very good. Uh, what weapons do A-10 Warthogs typically carry on a routine mission? I'm not, sh- not sure what a routine mission is, but what are your thoughts? Well, if you want to go with a routine training mission, you're going to go six BDU-33s, TGM-65 of some kind, and then depending on what you're doing, it could be some uh, one cap nine. The TGM-65, does that actually fire, or is it just simulated firing? It's just a camera, and mm-hmm. you can shoot it, and it will come out of inventory, and if you re-inventory it, it comes right back, and you can shoot it again, and re-inventory it, it'll come right back. Roger, and in terms of a live sortie, I suppose there's no such thing. I guess everything is bespoke. That's all dis- dictated by the ATO, Air Tasking Order. Roger. Okay, uh, what makes up the heaviest loadout you've put on a, on a plane? Oh, this is a good question, because I've... We've my units personally done some of the heaviest A10 mm-hmm. loadouts ever. Mm-hmm. Um, the the most complicated one was seven by GBU 12s, yeah. two by GBU 54, yeah, one laser Maverick, one IR Maverick, seven rockets, full load chaff flare, and full load of gun ammo. Good lord! Did you have a gross weight on that? The pilot broke the uh, gross weight. They had to defuel the aircraft down to like, I think mm-hmm. it was 7,900 pounds. Mm-hmm. Wow. I don't know the total point. weight, but it was like maxed. It was so maxed. The oh, QA guys have a, they have a computer program that will tell you your your CG and your max weight. And they said the pilot barely made the... <laughs> yeah, no, I, I can imagine. The one thing I heard in there was GBU-54. Did I, did I hear that right? That's correct. The laser JDAM. Laser... JDAM. Ooh. Imagine a GBU-38 that gets updates from a laser coming off your aircraft so it can hit moving targets. And if it loses the laser, it just goes to its last known good core. Roger, how interesting. Now, that's that's a really interesting piece of kit because at the moment we've got the laser-guided bombs and the JDAMs. And the laser-guided bombs are amazingly accurate in DCS as they are in real life. We can get them down to kind of two feet. Um, and and get you know kill just anything that, that, that it hits. But the JDAMs, the problem with the, these is in DCS, and I don't know whether this is real life or not, is that they're plus or minus 33 feet. We spoke to ED about this and said, why are they so inaccurate? And they are apparently plus or minus 33 feet, worst case scenario in real life. Um, and so to have a mix where you could just you know lob one off from miles away, like you could you know 30 miles away, like you could with a JDAM, and then have it guide on the terminal phase, um, it's pretty awesome. Um, yeah, and also ED's wrong on those numbers. I can tell you for a fact. I've seen targeting pod footage of one bomb going in the same hole. And one bomb goes into a building, and another bomb goes right through the Roger. Interesting. Hmm. Okay, very good. Anyway, um, uh, sorry, I've uh, lost my place. Are there any weapons that are particularly difficult to handle? I guess you were going to say heavy, but see what you think. Well, there is actually one that you can only handle with gloves because it will mess your hands up. Ooh because of the bomb body because mm-hmm. it's um it's not a steel bomb casing it's a composite casing aside from that uh, as far as handling characteristics of the weapons um on the a10 not really aim nines can be depending on your low crew makeup if you have a weak person on your crew i hurt my back doing that once mm-hmm. um uh, but we don't hand load a lot of our weapons. Um, some people have a lot of trouble with the BDU 33s on the turs because those are hand loaded mm-hmm. uh, aside from that uh, i would say the most Awkward, annoying, and dreaded thing would be slide loading Mavericks on LAW 88s, which is something we fortunately don't do anymore. Uh, and that would be the LAW 88 stays on the aircraft, and we have a slide that the Maverick sits on. Mm-hmm. We have to pick it up out of the casket with a mm-hmm. special device on our jammer, put it on the um, 
slide and then bring it over to the rail, line it up per perfectly mm -hmm. with that rail, and then slide it on, and it just gets all bound up and stuck. Mm -hmm. It's such a pain in the butt. I hate that load. Uh, I bet those Mavericks are pretty heavy as well. They're big old, big old units, aren't they? Um, yes, they are. The weights vary. What was that composite thing you were speaking about? That would be a version, oh god, five bomb body for the um, GBU thirty eight. So GBU thirty eight V five. It's a low collateral damage weapon. Basically, mm -hmm. creates a massive concussion mm -hmm. field as opposed to a big fragmentation field. Right. So it's got that fiberglass, whatever it is, rather than metal, so it doesn't frag as much. How interesting. Correct. Roger. Um, I have I have a quick question just to intercept here before I forget. Do you do any low, very low co collateral kind of small bombs, small warhead bombs? We don't have any so, issues. small diameter bomb has not been um, flight tested on the A-10. There's some mm. issues they're trying, mm. um, but there's some issues right now. However, we do have the GB-38 V-4, which is a, looks like a normal GB-38, mm. but it only has 25 pounds of explosives. Ah. Wow, how interesting. Okay. Right, very good. Um, how long does it take to reload the gun from empty? Hmm. Well, um, so I did send you some pictures of the ALA um, in work. Um, and I also have a YouTube link if you want to show that as well. However, the answer to this question varies from depends on how far away the ammo is from where you're at. Like if you're talking like the jet lands and mm -hmm. it needs reloaded, mm -hmm. it can be upwards of two hours before oh. I get it done, or it can be 30 minutes, depending on the situation. Mm. Mm. Is that, is this, um, is the, the actual work of loading, uh, the, uh, the, is it, we've got, is there a motor or is there a guy cranking a, handled or something if you play that youtube video there you'll see that it's hooked up to the aircraft Stand by. i just sent you the link so there's a flexible drive shaft that comes off of the hydraulic drive unit on the ala on the uh, gun system it it turns the ala so the aircraft hydraulics is powering both the gun and the ala that's how strong the hydraulic oh, system wow. is and that's only one hydraulic system i see the barrel turning around so what you're seeing there is them uploading and downloading all at the same time. Mm -hmm. There's live rounds going in, empty cases going out. Mm -hmm. You also see those plastic, those white plastic yeah. tubes that those guys are handling. They're massive. Those are called LTCs, link tube carriers. They are they carry the live rounds into the drum of the ALA, mm -hmm. which separates the tube from the round and then installs the casing in the tube. Where you get into trouble is you have if your tube starts to oval out, and yeah. then you have this this um, aluminum circle trying to go into an oval and it just jams up i've seen ammo loads go on for three and a half four hours sometimes wow i didn't know those plastic things were a thing that's interesting and that's all yeah, that's happening at uh, uh, several thousand rounds per minute isn't it well depending on your ala i would go slower than those guys those guys were really going fast i don't like to go that fast that's how you get jams it must have oh, been on a cold day and with a good ala all right I get it. All right awesome good job uh, let me stop that and get back. Lovely stuff. Um, right, where did we get two guys? I've lost it. There it is. Right, very good. Uh, so that answers the question. Uh, and, I, and that's got like 1,100 rounds or something, isn't it, for a full load? 1,150. Each of those cans that those dudes are standing on hold um, 575 rounds. You have mm -hmm. three cans come up on a normal single load trailer, mm -hmm. one empty can, and two full cans. Mm -hmm. You start filling up that empty can. So when, the, when you start, you roll up those tubes. You have empty tubes in your ALA. You roll them up, put them off to the side. Then you start filling up your can. You move the load head over. You fill up your next can. And then you tie on those empty tubes to finish emptying out the ALA. You end up with a full jet, empty cans, and empty ALA. Um, awesome. Very good. Uh, number nine. How often does an A10 take up uh, sidewinders? And out of interest, are those sidewinders, well, what are they... Uh, really designed to use for in, in that case are they designed to shoot down choppers or self-defense only or just just out of interest so originally that mod um which was done by a depot guy um it's a very simple mod that was done to the aircraft um to get aim nines on mm. the uh, pilot community wanted aim nines they wanted to feel like fighter pilots i mm. guess um but it opened up a new um operation or a new uh uh, role for us, which was off, which was counter helicopter, mm -hmm. um, to provide not just you know not just our close air support mission, but if we see a gunship flying around, we can we can smoke it. But also, it does provide self defense. They do ACM training once a month, so they do go up with AIM nines once a month, uh, Cap nines, and and do uh, BV or uh, mm -hmm. what you call it, BFM.
Mojo, because we've learned the hard way in DCS, even if you're in a fighter jet, don't go anywhere within five miles of an A-10, because it'll all, it, I don't know what it is, but if it's the pilot, it's a mentality, aggressiveness thing, but in DCS at least, yeah, shoot A-10s if you want, but shoot them over five miles away. Never get within range of an A-9, because you, and they can really turn really well, uh, at least for short periods of time as well. So it's just an anecdotal thing there, that, yeah, don't mess with them. Very true. Mm-hmm. Right, 10. Is there a maximum storage period for some of the weapons and bombs, and will you deny loading the, these on an aircraft? Can you give an example? So is there a sell-by date on use-by date on them? So munitions are, um, they have what's called their um, shelf life and then their in-use life. Mm -hmm. So if, if this is especially applicable to impulse cartridges and ammunition. However, bombs have a lot, much longer shelf life. They can last for decades. Mm -hmm. But your impulse cartridges, which are the little things that when you press the pickle button, that's what's going to open your bomb rack hooks and drive the pistons down or two little explosives. Mm -hmm. Those things have a very short lifespan. And those things we track and they're written on the side. Um, in fact, I can reject, I can reject um, impulse carts if their um, in-use date is not written on them clearly, mm -hmm. as long, along with their serial numbers and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and as far as some other weapons go, um, Mavericks, they have a pretty long, long shelf life because um, they get inspected. Missiles, all the missiles have regular inspection periods. Um, so mostly we, re we can reject impulse carts. We don't, and rockets sometimes. We don't normally reject the other weapons because their shelf lives are, and their in-use lives are huge. Mm -hmm. I mean, and a perfect example is um, in the Vietnam War, they were using World War II bombs. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, the, the inspections you mentioned, is that just a guy with a clipboard looking at the codes or is it someone going in with a screwdriver and opening stuff up? So the bomb bodies are inspected by the ammunition folks, the um, ammo guys who are the 2W1 or 2W0s. Um, those guys are a different career field for me and what they do is they build all the munitions and bring them to me. And I work closely with their people to ensure that I have the right munitions on the flight line. And they're always calling me to do cart inventories and flare inventories because things are getting misplaced. Uh, there's a lot of tracking that goes on behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, right. Uh, 11. Is it true that A-10s don't carry triple mount Mavericks because the inner one burns the tire slash landing gear? Never heard of that before. This is a true story. Uh, this is a true statement. Uh, Cold War loadouts for the A-10 were typically 4x Mavericks and 4x Mark 20s or CBU-87s when they came online. Uh, and that was true. They were worried about flashing off their tires. Um, and the other problem is it's just way too much drag. The, the, the Low 88s are already a lot of drag. Mm -hmm. And then you put three of them on there and it's even more. So they, they And also that's really close to that tire. So yes, that's so is this we're talking about the tire when it's inside and covered up even it's not covered up if you look at oh, the, yeah, the bottom half of the tire yeah. hangs out right i remember now wow interesting we've never had that in dcs have we i don't think we have it's not modeled not modeled it's not modeled how interesting work no. okay very good um is there a common visual identifier for training rounds that's simple and very good question. Yes, blue. There will be a blue stripe identifier on training rounds, or they'll be completely blue, like your BDU-33s, your CAP-9s, some of your rockets, and your LAGRAMs, your laser-guided training rounds, are all blue, all the way blue. Or like a market, like a, a BDU-50 will be all blue. Mm -hmm. um, some missiles will have a blue stripe uh, for uh, the warhead, will be blue. And then um, inert rocket motors will have a white stripe. Live rocket motors will have a brown stripe. Live warheads will have a yellow stripe. Oh, Joe, the training bullet rounds, are they, do they actually real shells that get fired? And if they're, so they're just like yes. solid steel or something? What they are is, um, they're also painted blue, the projectiles are, and they are a steel cord, aluminum shrouded projectile. Mm. Okay, fine. Uh, right, uh, who decides what weapons go on the plane? So uh, for the training purposes, the weapons officers and the, the training curriculum does. However, downrange, the CAOC, the Coalition Air Operation or Combined Air Operation Center, will decide that. And it will come out in the form of an air tasking order to the fleet and, a, and an SCL or standard configuration loadout. And then we will standardize configuration loadout and we will go and support that um, SCL and ATO. Um, the pilots do not choose. They can make <laughs> little tweaks. 
Roger. They can change things and they can feedback. There's a feedback loop. So they can be like, no, this isn't working. We want to do this. And then they have a representative at the KOC who will go to the, the KOC commander and be like, the, the air operations boss, be like, hey, this isn't working. We need to do this. And normally that gets approved and they get what they want. Roger. Out of interest, how does it physically come to you? Is it like on a sheet of paper? Is it one of these new touchpad things? Or is it a guy talking in your ear? Let's just say it comes over Cipernet which is the secure internet, mm -hmm. and then I get it through means. Yeah, Roger. Okay, that's fine. Um, fifth, uh, sorry, uh, missed one out. So we decided, how did you get in? How did you get to your current role? So what are they asking? Well, it's obvious, you know, from school. Uh, where did you leave and get to do what you do? So I wanted to go to college, so I joined the Guard. And then uh, the first career field I had wasn't working out, so I wanted to cross-train. My brother was an aircraft crew chief at the time. He's like, hey, come over to AMXS. So I went to the recruiters, and I was like, what's open in AMXS? And they're like, well, we got everything. Uh, and uh, AMXS is the Aircraft Generation Squadron. That's the flight line squadron. You've had guys on before who were what they said phase maintainers, mm. like the E&E &E guy mm. and your phase crew chiefs. Those mm. guys are from the maintenance squadron. We're all under the same maintenance group, but we're different squadrons. Mm -hmm. uh, so I went to the guy, and he's like, yeah, I, want to, I wanted to be in that squadron on the flight line. And he's like, well, we got crew chief, we got avionics, we got weapons. We're like, oh, weapons sounds cool. Mm -hmm. And, well, there you go. That's how, that's how it happened. And then fast forward um what has it been now almost 16 years and Roger. here i am right must be enjoying it excellent okay uh so that's that uh which weapons categories are used most often i'm guessing this means in life fire and not training but answer it however you want in combat i have to say the gun I the gun know. is the most yeah and um it's not the pilot's decision most most of the time it mostly comes down to the jtacs mm -hmm. or in the cases like when we were fighting isis there wasn't always JTACs that were like these, uh, for lack of a better word, it's not their official word, but kill cells, like these mm -hmm. groups of people who were watching feeds from ISR platforms, combined force intel, and then they had lawyers and commanders and Iraqi officers and stuff, and they all came up with like, yep, we want this dead, kill it, mm -hmm. and then, they, then the pilots would figure it out. Mm -hmm. But most of it is always, most of the time in CAS situations, it's guns, guns, guns. Mm -hmm. Okay, is that an effectiveness thing, or uh, I'm interested, do you reckon that's from a physical kill point of view or my psychological point of view are you trying to put the willies up the uh, the bad guys is that what the jtacs were trying to do or in that in those cases negative it's always from the lethality standpoint because they are trying to neutralize a threat they don't call in the a10s unless they really want something dead and when they do they want the gun because it's low collateral damage it's mm. like it's like a directional cluster bomb because that hei ammunition is is fragmentary, high explosive, it does mm -hmm. an immense amount of damage, and that's what they want to have. And they want it close, and they want it exactly where they can put it, and they can put that, those gun rounds. So, like, you know, you know, in DCS, we, like, look for a tank, or we look for mm. um, a building. Mm. However, in the real world, they're looking for a guy hiding behind a rock in some trees. Mm. Mm. So you can't really put, like, your bomb right on that guy. Mm. So the best way to do is put a string of 300 rounds through that general area, and you're guaranteed to get them. Roger. And how are they... How are they describing? Because it, from the air, you can't see a man, right? I mean, you definitely can't in DCS. I've never attacked a man before, or even a group of men I've never attacked because you can't see it. Do they say, like, um, that tree line there, uh, 20 meters west of that, or how do they compare to the pilot? What this goes into is it goes into some of the, the new technology that the A-10 has as far as the um, the new lightning pod rover capability, which downlinks to the JTAC with the lightning pod seeing. Mm -hmm. And the, the JTACs are not doing the more, they're not normally doing the nine line procedures mm -hmm. anymore. They're doing a lot more of the, what's called a direct talk on, and they're working them into a, a good essay of the general vicinity that they want those rounds to be in. Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily saying, hey, hit that rock. Mm -hmm. Like if you can hit this tree line from, from this area to this area, and they're looking at the TG Mm -hmm. footage and be like yep you're in the right spot you're looking at the right thing mm -hmm. i want you to shoot that so that's a lot of and they also use their lasers they just put their lasers mm -hmm. out to help them and uh to help them spot track and stuff like that so there's a lot that goes into it um i watched some cct's close up um calling gun runs on our flight line when we were in um uh estonia they were dry runs so no rounds were fired obviously mm -hmm. uh, and it was pretty interesting to watch them work Roger, and that's uh, really interesting. I'd love to, I never thought about the idea of using LSS for anything other than uh, a, a strike on a tank or something. Um, I'd love to uh, do some more missions, just thinking out loud now, where we have cast, we have a bunch of insurgents hidden in trees and stuff like that, and we've got a guy that can laze, 
uh, either from the ground or from the air. Um, we can LSS that uh, and not to drop laser guided bombs on, but just to, even to gal, you know. Uh, we've never even thought about that kind of thing. So, and I don't know if it's modeled in DCS, but the pilots fly with NVGs and they can physically see the lasers as yeah. well, so that helps out. Interesting. Okay, yeah, we'll get some more of that done. Uh, the problem at the moment with the A-10, the A-10, um, it's been superseded in DTS now because uh, I don't know anyone that drives an A-10 anymore. Everyone, It's been superseded by the FA-18, which has got most of its functionality, and the F-16 is going to have most of its functionality and stuff like that. So one day it will come back around, I imagine, but it's going to be a while before we're back onto CAS again. I think. Yes, if you had a sweet 9 F uh, F uh, A-10C, you would be flying a lot more of it. Roger. And What we have is a sweet 3. Right, okay. Right, anyway, let's push on. Um, uh, are there any G limits on some of the bombs or equipment you're loading that the pilot needs to be aware of? Not for the A-10, not really. Uh, GBU-12 is about it on, on the A-10, because he can't pull more Gs in the plane than the weapons can handle. Watch out, makes sense. Okay. Is there anything weapons loaders are known for? I don't really understand that, but... Uh, yeah, it's called traveling in threes. Whenever you look around, you're gonna if you look for a weapons loader, you normally see three of them because mm -hmm. normally load crews stick together. Load crew is three guys or girls, um, and they stick together normally. So we're known for being found in threes and breaking. Um, why are you in threes? Because you need to be in threes for lifting stuff and stuff. Uh, it's a three-man certified load crew. So mm -hmm. when we go through our load training process, which is a certification process on all of our munitions, you're certified in your position one, two, and three, and you're certified as a crew. Mm -hmm. And then that your crew is your crew. So the load crew ch chief is like a staff or a tech, and he has, or in the active duty world, they're senior airman crew chiefs, I guess. But um, and they run the other two crew members. Um, they're their direct reports, and then I give the crew chief. The, his marching order, um, I give him a sheet with a configuration I want him to go load or some maintenance I want him to do, and then he and his crew go do it, and he's in charge of them. So it's a it's a certified team that has to work together. Roger, very good. Okay, which type of gun ammo does the A-10 carry on ground support? I guess he means CAS missions. HEI uh, hmm. all the time. And that's All downrange is HEI. High explosive high incendiary. Explosive incendiary. Yeah. And what's doing the damage there? Is it a fragmentation or the, and a concussion? All of the above. Okay. All of it. Okay, very good. Uh, how long do you... We've already answered this one. How do you long do you think the A-10 will be in service? We've agreed 2030, was that right? Yeah, I think it'll be in service a little past that, um, especially in the guard units. So it'll mm. be tougher to, to oust them from... More jump. Okay, very good. Uh, how... Send. Are they still producing them? No, Fairchild Republic went out of business in the 80s. They haven't made wow. them since like 83 or 84. Wow, so these are all 40 year old, These are 40 plus year old airframes then. Yes, yeah, so but we have brand new wings though, made in <laughs> Korea by Boeing. <laughs> you go, he's got lovely new wings. That's good to know. Right, um, how long is taking oh, how long is taking you to unload a fully combat loaded A10 and do you have to check every bomb rocket or pod for damage prior to the unloading process? That's interesting. Yeah, they, um, we inspect our weapons before downloading them. Uh, they get inspected every day, actually. They mm -hmm. get inspected by me for a supervisory, what's called post-load inspection, and they mm -hmm. get inspected by load crews when they launch them, when they recover them. They're getting inspected all the time. And when they're downloaded, they're inspected as well. And depends on your combat configuration. It's hard to answer this. I could say anywhere from mm -hmm. like an hour mm -hmm. from start to finish to all the way up to including maybe four hours, I think, our ice, our um. Our, uh, anti our configuration we were flying against ISIS was about a three and a half hour, four hour download fully mm -hmm. with ammo. Mm -hmm. um, and when you say you're doing these inspections, what are you actually looking for? What's going to be wrong with a bomb or a rocket or whatever? All kinds of things. You can have rockets unseated. You could have um, you could have switches set incorrectly, fuse settings set incorrectly, doors open, fuse access doors open. You can have damage to it, damage to seekers. Birds mm -hmm. can hit them. Mm -hmm. Uh, arming wire can come loose. Um, you're, you can have initiators that come loose. You can have all kinds of things that, that I mean, there's a lot. That, a bomb is a system of systems. Mm. It's not just a bomb. So there's a lot that goes into these bombs that you have to look at. So, yeah, so it sounds like there's a lot of engineering there, and all engineering can go wrong at the end of the day. So, hmm, makes sense. Um, okay, now the ones that we've got stars by are what we call the low-priority ones. We'll come back to them if we get time. Otherwise not. It's just simply because we're so much against the clock. 22. Um, how much authority does the pilot have to reject taking up a certain round of or of a, a munition? 
Uh, Pilot has ultimate authority to reject the aircraft at any time he wants. He also has an ultimate authority to just take the airplane if he wants to, no matter what it's doing. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, he has the authority if he wants to. Um, and could you think of a reason why he might reject something? Like you're trying to put some Mark 82s on or whatever, and he rejects that. Is there a, a logical reason you can think of it? Yeah, because normally that happens because we're putting the wrong weapons up. <laughs> <laughs> That's happened before, yeah. um, where you, you get told to go load this jet with this, and the guy steps out to it, and he's like... Um, this isn't what I need. I need something else. And then you, that's when you, you know, you go white face and start, you know, right. oh crap, oh crap, oh crap. Yeah, well, that's what I checked. So he gets a copy of the ATO as well then. Was that ATO? The right oh, yeah, it comes from Ops. Right. And he, he knows exactly, his his um, his DTC is loaded with exactly what he expects to have on that airplane. Roger. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, uh, 23. How many times in a day would you load up a hog? Well, it depends on your your operational cycle, but I'd say normally about two. Roger. Asymmetric mission loads on the A-10, possible or not? Yes, and almost always mm. is it asymmetrical. That's what, I, that's what I thought, because you can't even have a symmetrical load on, I don't think in DCS, the Mavericks one-sider. No, I think I may be wrong, I can't remember. Um, and why do you, why did you say there's almost always an asymmetrical loadout? What? Uh, TGP, because your TGP, you only fly one, mm -hmm. goes on station two or ten, mm -hmm. uh, and then you normally only fly one TGM, and that goes on station three. Mm -hmm normally if it's working mm -hmm. and then sometimes if you got cap nines they're going to go on station ele or 11 mm -hmm. so yeah you're going to be always asymmetric yeah roger makes sense okay uh, what is the single most emphasized safety related thing in your job this is an easy one minimum amount of explosives minimal amount of time with minimal amount of people that's the main thing we emphasize in our job that in maintaining the net explosive late for the load site which means making sure you know how much explosive is allowed, net explosive weight is allowed in that area, and then you don't let more of it get in there that should. And when you say area, you're meaning physical area of, of, of apron or, or whatever. The load site, every site, like your load site, your mm -hmm. aircraft parking spot is sited for, sited for a certain amount of explosives. Mm -hmm. And the whole ramp itself is sited for a certain amount of explosives, mm -hmm. which is why at places like davis Monthan and Nellis, you have these like weird areas that are off to the side that mm -hmm. are the live load areas. Because they need to be a certain distance from civilization so that they don't blow everything up if something mm -hmm. goes horribly wrong. Mm -hmm. But if you bring too much explosives in there, whatever safety precautions or distances that they had decided for that particular environment will now be busted. And then if there were to be an accident, you could do damage and hurt people. So minimal amount of explosives, minimal amount of time, minimal amount of people, and maintain your net explosive weight are the main things you want to worry about. Mm -hmm. Okay, that sounds like a pretty good, <laughs> good thing. I'm sure that'll make us all very happy. Uh, fine. Uh, is there anything you've learned in training where they said, don't do this or you will die? Well, everything is pretty safe. Well, most of these munitions are designed to be very, very safe. But one thing I can think of is when you're wiring the tail fins on a GBU-12 with the actuation lanyard, whatever you do, don't stand directly in front of the fins and start yanking on the lanyard when you're wiring it because it could actuate the lever and then the fin will come out and hit you. In uh, do they kind of, yeah, spring loaded, aren't they? Go ping and they spring out, don't they? A firm, yeah. Right. Okay. I can see you. Yeah. And bearing in mind the size of this thing, that's going to do a bit of damage. Okay. Very good. Um, if you are to conduct tests and have to fire the main gun on the ground, do you have to strap and secure the airframe to keep it stable? Interesting. Okay. So this question is kind of fun that we do not test fire the gun on the ground mm -hmm. ever. The only people who do this are Eglin and they do it with the gun on a test stand. Mm -hmm. They test every lot of ammo that's produced mm -hmm. down at Eglin. I've seen it. It's one of the most amazing things I've seen in mm -hmm. my entire life. It was awesome uh, to be that close to a, a 30 mil firing off. However, um, the Air Force did do this. There's a YouTube video you can go find um, where they did do this and they, mm -hmm. they jacked the aircraft up and they chained it down as mm -hmm. best they could and they did fire it engines running sitting on the ground uh it, it was done once roger we, in our simulator it does blast us back doesn't it gents um, and in fact we use it the only way we can land a hog on an aircraft carrier i know it sounds silly but is with the gun because there's so much recoil comes from the gun it slows us like an extra 200 meters uh, so you should not it. you should not be able to fire the gun on the ground it would not fire ah that's interesting anyone got any comeback on that because don't we have a special switch in the charlie model to make it far, far on the ground Oh. Yeah, there's a safety override switch. If you look at the on your left, all the way back to the red guard. The ground safety flip. override switch. Yeah, I know what it is, but it's still you shouldn't be able to fire the gun. Mm. It shouldn't 
shouldn't fire. All right, I don't uh, want that. I... I don't want that change in DCS, so I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna argue with that. Um, right. Uh, if you could test, are there any weapon settings that must be set on the ground? So, okay, fine. Almost all of them. Right. Everything from the rounds limiter on the gun uh, to all of your fuse settings, uh, all of your um, pulse codes for your your GBU-12 and your GBU-54. Uh, all your fuse settings, all of that stuff has to be set on the ground because there's one caveat, which is the FMU-152 fuses, which uh, DCS, for some reason, decided fuses aren't a thing, which <laughs> yeah, I you don't understand. That. <laughs> yes. Um, if you look at the model of the GBU-38 that DCS uses, it has an uh, M904 nose fuse, which is a mechanical nose fuse. We never use those on, G on JDAMs. It mm -hmm. just is not something we would do. They mm -hmm. just took the their Mark 82 model and slap the gray tail kit on the back of it. Mm -hmm. um, there's a there's a myriad of different fuses we use, and all of their switches have to be set on the ground. Um, the FMU 152 um, has the ability to talk back through mm -hmm. the 1760 connector that's in the JDAM to the aircraft, so it can be the pro, the settings can be changed by the pilot. However, if that were to fail, it would default to whatever the mechanical settings are on the fuse. So almost everything has to be set on the ground. Roger. Uh, finally, I've got something to add. I only took 28 questions. Um, I remember recently when redoing the A10C tutorials, we have a page, an armament page, that the real uh, hog doesn't have. I've now forgotten the name. It might be DTOS is ringing a bell, but I may have that completely wrong. It's where you can go in and change all of your fuses and stuff like that. And what we found out by talking to Loader or someone else I can't remember is that that's not a real page. It's just simulating the ground crew doing it. So like you said, Everything, when you're changing your fuses, your setups, everything on those weapons, that's actually a guy with a, whatever, a screwdriver or a tool physically on the ground doing it. Screwdrivers, right? <laughs> right. Um, so that's that. Uh, is there a certain... Let me just make sure I got that. Is there a certain order that weapons are loaded? That's interesting. Yeah, there is. It's right to left. Always As right the pilot to... sits right to left. Okay. That's it. Is there a reason for that or is it just keep uniformity? Uniformity. Mm-hmm. What? Normally what happens is, though, the order becomes whatever shows up at the load site first. Okay, yeah, well, there's, there's theory and reality at the end of the day, isn't it, I suppose? So. Um, what is done with the munitions which expired their shelf life, used for practice, wars? They go back to the manufacturer. Moja. I wonder if they get recycled or not. That'd be interesting, wouldn't it? Okay. Um, 31, do certain munitions always get placed the same, or does it not matter? Like, yes, because there's only certain stations that can carry certain things. So Mavericks 3 and 9, JDAMs on 3, 4, mm. 5, 7, 8, and 9. Fuel tanks only on 6. Um, you can put dumb bombs anywhere. AIM-9s on 1 and 11 only. Um, ECM 111 only. TGPs 2 and 10. Rockets you can put on a lot of the stations, but not 1 and 11, not 6. Uh, so, there, yeah, there's, there's limits, but not too many. And that's because the physical wing pylons, presumably, have specific engineering in them, electrics and, and engineering. It's the connectors. They connectors. don't have the connectors. Some of them don't have the right connectors. Mm -hmm. Okay, makes sense. Uh, 32, does anyone actually call it the Thunderbolt? Oh, didn't even remember No, that hog. Yep. Hog. It's the hog. Roger. Is there a connection between the amount of fuel loaded and the maximum weapon load? We've just heard from that, but can you please continue. Absolutely. That's true. Yep. Yeah, because I remember in DCS, if you take loads of bombs, you have to knock yourself down to 30% of fuel to stay under takeoff weight and hope to hope to you know take off within a mile and a half. Uh, we're going to skip over the non-priority. 34, was there ever a laser-guided Maverick for the A-10? Not just was, there is. We used to have the E models, now we have the L models. Hmm. Have we got that in DCS, chaps? I can't remember. Nope. I wonder why. I mean... I don't know why anyone in the world would ever use a laser maverick anyway, but I've never used one. because I have why? a great war story about laser mavericks when Same. we get a time oh. for it. Okay, okay. Just guys, don't let me forget. Uh, was there ever a laser gun maverick? Right, uh, 36. What is the lifespan of the... How interesting. Of the main gun barrels, brackets, number of rounds before replacing, or is it dependent on, on the ammo fired? So I confirmed this with my uh, gun shop supervisor, and it's 36,000 rounds uh, for a normal barrel set, but if it's on a combat schedule... Um, it has a uh, thirty thousand round uh, barrel uh, rounds life for the barrel. Roger. So thirty six. Did you say thirty six thousand or thirty six hundred? Thirty six thousand rounds. Oh God, that's loads. That's like thirty six full. That's max. not that much. And uh, when we were fighting ISIS, we were going through barrel sets well, like two or three a week. 
Wow. And the barrel set is literally replacing all six or seven barrels then? All seven barrels, and that's on only 12 jets. Wow. Okay. I had no idea. And wearing out physically means wearing out, I guess. Uh, just the metal stripping off it or whatever. Or mm, Okay. Um, 37. Was there an A-10 variant with no rotary gun? And if so, what was the reason? How odd. So there is an A-10 that's owned by either NOAA or NASA that they wanted to use to fly into storms. I don't know if it has its gun. I think they may have took the gun out because that gun has to be mm. under military control at all times. So it has to have ballast or something up there. Mm. How interesting. Okay, I was unaware of that, but it makes sense because it's a you know it's a decent flying machine at the end of the day and very robust. Okay, um, thirty nine. There's a lot of discussions of whether the A ten is going to be going to use depleted depleted uranium for the Avenger again, or the tungsten penetrator in the future. Your opinion? You best take this back to the basics because I don't know anything about even what a depleted uranium. Blah blah blah. So the DU is our API rounds. Um famous from the Gulf War, um, and we haven't used them since from the first Gulf War. They haven't been used since. And yes, the Air Force wants to go to tungsten penetrators. They will not be as effective, but it's not currently fully funded as a... Right. So the depleted uranium, I'm guessing that it must be a heavy metal, like lead, but not soft, I'm, I'm presuming. It's a dense metal. It's a dense metal that when it hits the armor of the tank... It turns that armor, it liquefies that armor, and then mm. spews it into the inside of the... How interesting. I've never heard of that before. And what kind of armor penetration did they have? Like, what thickness armor, roughly? Like tank thickness armor? Well, at first, but as time went on, the, the Soviet <laughs> tanks evolved, and then mm. the, they've really learned that unless you shoot them right in the back, mm. it's really, right in the engine compartment, it's mm. really not going to kill a tank. You might mission kill it, you might damage it, mm. but you're not going to kill it. Roger. Okay, very good. Um, the Warthog seems to have a more more capable and complex weapons load. So why doesn't it use a separate gunner like the Apache? Uh, it doesn't the need it. It doesn't need it. The pilot, the, these pilots just train hard. That's why mm -hmm. they're really good at what they do is because um, they have a complex platform, but they mm -hmm. train hard to use it. So. Yeah, and it is a complex platform in DCS. Um, certainly, I know it's what will do you say it's the most complex plane out there? I struggle with it. I'm not going to lie. I've always struggled with it. Um, you really need to put lots of hours to learn that thing to be actually useful and effective. Um, how often is the GAL-8 used compared to other anti-personnel weapons? We've already answered that. Uh, is it more or less effective than munitions like rocket pods and CBUs? Well, you can scratch CBUs because we're not going to use those unless China invades mm. or something. And uh, as far as rockets... Um, so mm -hmm. laser guided rockets are much more effective because they can hit the guy right in the back. Mm. But uh, if you have a lot of dudes you're trying to kill, you're going to use the uh, the gun. And as far as usage frequency, the gun gets used a lot more often. As mm -hmm. far as effectiveness, I'd say the laser rocket would be your most effective if you're trying to kill like a small group of guys. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, just things I picked up there. CBUs. Why aren't you using CBUs? Uh, because of treaties and stuff. We okay. didn't sign the treaties, but we're still yeah. trying to be friendly to it. And it's it, there's a lot of there's a lot of nastiness that comes with those. So we that's a break glass in time of real war kind of. Roger. And the and, yeah, follow-up, do you have laser-guided rockets on the hog? Oh, yeah. Oh, I had no idea. We must have an older version then, I guess. But Yes. Like I said, if you had a Sweet 9 version, you'd like it better. Do they have, like, block versions like they have in uh, F-16 and F-18, if you know what I mean? Like Yes. Yeah, we have what called Sweets. What you, what you have, what we have, is the Sweet 3 in DCS. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. We're all the way up to suite 9. They're working on 10 and 11. Roger. Interesting. Very good. The, the problem with CBUs is they're like mines. They leave unexploded munitions. I see. So, right. So that's why you can't use them. Mm. That's true. That's very true. Okay, guys. Uh, which one is preferred? The GBU-31, 2,000 pound or 38, 500 pound of, or the laser-guided variants? You're almost going to say it's mission dependent, but what do you think? It's all target dependent. It's all the target. Weaponeering goes into what the target is and the collateral damage. So there's no really like, preferred. Mm. Mm. So it's a tool, and like you use the right kind of screwdriver for the right kind of screw head. It's just, just like that, I suppose. A firm. Roger. How long will how long will take to pull the main gun out for repairs or to replace? And have you ever had a jammed round to deal with? It takes approximately half a day to yank the gun out, all of it, feed system, drum, hydraulic drive unit, and gun. 
Um, as far as uh, repairs, um, if it's you know it goes out for twenty five month in, or twenty five thousand round inspections, um, it gets a full overhaul, um, and it's in during that time or twenty four months, whatever occurs first, and then we put it back up. The backup part takes a little longer because of the safety wiring and everything is really pain in the butt, so it can take upwards of. For a really good crew, they can do it in a day, mm-hmm. maybe a little less. They can have it fully installed. I've seen some crews struggle with it, make it take a day and a half. But I've seen good crews put it up and have it functional in about a day. Um, and as far as jam rounds, yeah, I've seen a lot of jam guns, a lot of jam guns. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the most famous of which was a uh, slow burning round. So the primer was struck. It left the, the gun before it went off. It went off in what's called the turnaround unit, which is – which turns the element chain around right at the gun system, right mm-hmm. at the gun drum. And it blew up right there and it destroyed the uh, feed system. Um, but it jammed up the gun with live rounds in the gun and the firing pin in uh, mm-hmm. the one firing pin was in battery on one of the seven bolts. You have seven bolts for seven gun, uh, barrels. The firing pin was in battery. We couldn't get out of battery. We couldn't, we couldn't safe it. We worked until from like 8.30 at night until midnight on this thing. The next day, they surgically disassembled the gun, just downloaded the gun housing Mm -hmm. itself. So barrels are gone, feed systems gone, everything's gone. Buried it in sandbags, drove it to the other end of the base, and the EOD guys blew it up. (laughs) Wow. That's amazing. And that shows how dangerous those rounds are, really. You know, you've got a cannon. It's not not a 2 2 rifle. You've got a cannon ready to blow up, aren't you, really? Yeah, I've seen mid-barrel collisions um, blow panels out that sever hydraulic lines, mm-hmm. uh, cause belly landings. I've seen them blow the bottom of a... I've heard of uh, 694, one of our jets um, had a mid-barrel collision, so round goes down the barrel and stops, another round goes and oh, hits it. Gold. Blows the uh, blows, blows the barrel apart, and that blows the panels off the bottom of the jet. God, can you imagine? A lot of things. Yeah, so... Yeah, there's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of... Uh, Selfridge had a jet... Uh, they had a jam, some sort of collision in the, some sort of problem in the gun system. There was a, there was a, some parts started flying and ripped apart the, uh, emer- the ground canopy e- uh, ejection system, mm-hmm. and caused the canopy to eject off the airplane. <laughs> That's such Grim Reaper's thing, isn't it, boys? Okay. Yeah, he had, be- he had a belly land that one too. Uh, following on beautifully, beautifully from that, if the A10 is to belly land on overshoot the runway sorry if the a10 is to belly land or overshoot the runway or crash um is it's you the one called to unload the remaining ammo before the aircraft is recovered or moved and any stories to tell hmm i've never had to do this personally but what will happen is the crash recovery folks will come out with these bladders and they'll fill them up with air and it'll lift the jet up and then they'll lower the landing gear down and then mechanically, and then set it back on its landing gear, and then we'll down. Mm-hmm. Unless there's damaged weapons, and in which case, like if it's like in a real unsafe place, mm-hmm. in which case we'll try to figure out a way to get the bombs off the wings at mm-hmm. least, so they have places for their bladders to go. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we'll we we'll go in there if we have to. But mostly it's crash recovery guys who will mm-hmm. who will right that ship and get it up on its wheels so we can. Mm-hmm. We can- mm, sounds like a bit of a nightmare. Okay. Uh, 45. When the Avenger is used in a mission, is the cloud of smoke and particles we see dense enough to cause any damage to the engines when ingested? How interesting. So, no. That would be very bad. But it can snuff out the motors. Mm. So, the A-10 has a system. Those slats that are on the leading edges of the wings right next to the fuselage are not slats for maneuvering. What happens is when you pull the gun trigger, a signal goes to a flight control relay box which says to those things, hey, pop up, and they pop up. And they divert the um, gun gas away from the engines. And at the same time, the engine igniters start firing so mm-hmm. that if the engine were to kind of get snuffed out, it would relight right away. How interesting. Is that a thing on the Series 3 jet that we've got? Yeah, it's on. it's been there since the beginning. Hmm. I was unaware. Okay, very good. Uh, 46. Napalm bombs on the A-10 as an option in the past? Question mark. Negative. Napalm's been out of service since Vietnam. A firm. How much ammo does the gun get? Well, uh, 1,000. Oh, how much ammo does the gun, does a gun strafe? Anyone? I think he's about talking about strafe. Ah. And that's mission dependent. Training missions, like like 50 rounds. He tries to get like two or three shots out of it. We, we give him 100 rounds per training mission. Mm-hmm. We try to get about 50 rounds per, per trigger squeeze. Mm-hmm. In combat, it's like 100 to 300. Roger. Okay. 
Um, what is the maximum weight the A-10 can carry? That depends on altitude, where you're taking off from, and the weather. But uh, normally around like 46,000. Is that just the stores, the 46,000, or is that gross? No, that's gross. Roger. Okay, very good. A DCS is a pretty good pretty good model on that, so whatever mm -hmm. DCS says is pretty accurate. Roger. Uh, 49, when depleted uranium has been loaded and fired, do you have to take extra precautions when reloading the aircraft? Wouldn't know, because I've never done it. it. Hasn't happened since 91. Am I missing the obvious? Depleted means it's not radioactive. Is that what the concern is? Not exactly. What's the, the main concern is the dust. Okay, so, so uranium dust is a bad thing then, basically. I suppose any... any yeah, uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, Any metal dust is bad and poison you, so I guess that makes sense. Okay, fine. Um, is the gun ammunition percussion cap or electronically fired? And if the latter, when loading the aircraft, do you have a RF exclusion zone around the aircraft? So it's percussion fired. Um, the the M sixty one series guns, all those twenty mils on all the other jets, they're electrically fired. Mm -hmm. um, and as far as RF, we always have, we always take what our hero precautions is what we call them, or RF exclusion precautions. So we have special radios that are that are hero safe. Uh, but we try to keep electronics away from the electrically primed stuff. Uh, so we always take those precautions. But no, the ammo's percussion. Roger. And is there any reason why you think it's percussion or uh, rather than electric? And is there any advantages of either? It's just big. I don't know if they can do it electrical. And it's also more reliable. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Uh, does the weight and the balance affect the A-10 a lot? Because I've heard that non-symmetrical payloads are possible. Hmm. Weight and balance affects the airplane in other ways as far as CG. But as far as we already talked about asymmetrics. Roger. Does the gun ammo get expelled from the airframe or is it retained after being fired? How much are reloads? It stays in the aircraft because that much aluminum flying out mm. of the airplane it, it make a big pain in the butt for the guy coming behind you. And then also uh, CG, you're losing a lot of weight mm. real fast. So they want to keep it in the, in the gun. Mm. And then how much are reloads? Maybe how many are reloads? Uh, 1150, 575 per can. And we can do a top off load too, which is a little more common. Mm. One thing I never um, quite got is, you know, those plastic um, kind of tubes that the, the, the shells are in. Do they are they do they go into the gun, or, or is that only for loading those plastic containers? Those things, the a, inside the ALA is a big drum with some rims al along it. Those get caught on one of those rims and stay to the to the. If you're looking oh. at the ALA from the cans on the right mm. side of the ALA, and the rounds get dragged out of them right. by another rim, and then the the casings get put back into those white tubes mm -hmm. and then put back into the cans. Right. Okay. So so the tubes don't go up in the air, basically. The, the... Oh no, they don't right. go in the gun. Gotcha. Uh, 55, does the DSMS, the Digital Stores Management Screen or System, automatically select the loaded ordnance, or is it loaded via a cartridge slash a terminal? Interesting. Uh, so the A-10 is not that smart. So uh, in the future, the, all jets will have what's called uh, common stores integration or something like that, where the, most of the stores information will be stored on the weapons themselves. Mm -hmm. But for now, with the A-10, with its analog bomb racks and stuff, it'll say, hey, I, I see something. I know there's something on the station, but you haven't told me what it is. Mm -hmm. So you use your DTC to program in what you want, or you can hand jam it. So the DTC has the, the loadout. Right. Okay, that makes sense. And we don't have that, do we? We we just it just magically appears on our on our DSMS, doesn't no, it? No, no. If you if you if you do a, a a hot start jet and then you do a new configuration, you're gonna mm -hmm. have to go to um, load page, load all, wait for it to populate, and then you'll get your load, your configuration. Oh, right. Same thing we do. It's the same exact thing we do in the airplane. Yeah. Right. I remember. Okay. Very good. Um, how many AGM? How many Mavericks can the Hog carry, and what types are usually used? Is it six? Six. Yes, is max. Typical, one or two. Mm. And what we normally fly is either a mix of EOIR or laser IR. Do you usually use the larger or the smaller warheaded versions? Yep. So, um, when we were downrange, it was a lot of Gs and Ls when we last time we used them. Mm. And the Ls have a much, they have a blast penetration warhead with a variable fuse there's a switch where we can change the fuse setting on that one mm -hmm. um, and then the g's which are the heavier warhead roger cool uh, 57 how hard how hard does your heart pound handling such highly explosive munitions 
Only when things go wrong. Only when things go wrong. <laughs> Only when somebody drops a bomb yeah. or or jams up an ALA to the point where they've yeah. cut rounds in half and there's yeah. propellant all over the place. And stuff. Wow. Awesome. Okay. Uh, why has the A-10A been such a successful weapons platform, in your opinion? Because it's, uh, it's simple. Because it's simple in how it was designed. Um, and also because and I, I had a lengthy discussion once with uh, Pierre Spray, the oh, guy who... Interesting. Just, who um, helped come up with this concept mm -hmm. and uh, what he did. There's a lot of that. If you look at the A-10 and how it looks and how it functions and how easy it is for me to load weapons, and how mm -hmm. many weapons I can fit on it and all that kind of stuff. Those were all choices that they and his design team made mm. to get it that way. So that, that goes into it. Uh, a lot of the success goes into it. And then also the success of the pilots. I mean, if not for what they were able to accomplish in the first Gulf War, mm -hmm. it, the plane would be gone. Watch so out. those kind of things make it successful. I find it interesting. I mean, just talking about spray, spray, and I'm not saying it's just him alone or whatnot, but he's obviously linked to the F-16 as well, which is obviously um, night and day compared to the A-10, the A-10. But the other thing that it does have in common is that it's like the A-10. It's kind of no compromise. It's designed to do, if you like, one job and that job really well and be designed all around that job. I know things have changed. The F-16 got heavier and fatter later on and started bombing and stuff. Um, and again, that's maybe one of the reasons why the F-16 was so so successful. But. You're absolutely right, and that's what that was one of the design philosophies that him and his friends had was you're going to design it around a mission. You're not mm. going to make it some end all be all. Mm. Do everything. Of course, that's how planes have ended up nowadays. But okay, that's fine. Um, uh, while loading, while, while loading the gun ammo, can and what would happen if your hands get stuck? That's morbid thinking, but okay. Well, if you look at that video, you see how fast all that stuff's yeah, going and all force. that stuff that's turning. Uh -huh. You will lose skin, yeah. fingers. You will lose things. I can tell you. We had uh, a large industrial automatic uh, plane, like sander. You know, huge thing, weighs a couple of tons. At the, um, at the place I worked before I got sick, and the guy got his hand in there, and it took it. it, it just took it out, and it was just bone left. That was all that was left. Urgh, horrendous. Um, and sixty-three. How is the main gun on the A10 cooled down, and is possible to fire until you run out of ammo, or just bursts to keep it cooler? It's cooled by air, and uh, after you release the trigger, and DCS doesn't have this model, mm. it's going to start it's going to start a cooling process where it spins around mm -hmm. because the it opens up the barrels. It, it moves the bolts around and mm -hmm. allows air to flow down the barrels. Mm -hmm. And there's also that scoop on the bottom is allowing that whole gun cavity to be filled with, mm -hmm. um, with air to keep it cool. And as far as firing till you run out of ammo, unless you have a little bit of ammo left, you're not going to be able to do that because the gun control unit is going to stop you. The electric gun control unit or the ECU is going to say, nope, you've fired too many rounds now. You've cooked the barrels. You're done. And if you fired more than 600 rounds, I'm pretty sure the barrels would be white hot and mm -hmm. would probably start falling apart. Uh, yeah, right. Well, luckily, we don't have that in DCS. We can just fire 11,000, 1,100 rounds. But yeah, okay. Very good. Uh, is the recoil on the Avenger strong enough to slow the plane when fired? No. <laughs> That's the thing. I mean, there's a lot of force there, but think how much kinetic energy or mechanical energy is in an aircraft. It's almost, if you do the half MV squared or whatever, the amount of energy in a plane is just almost unbelievable. Yeah, you have a 40,000 pound jet in a 30 degree dive at yeah. doing 300 knots. It's not going to slow it down. Billions of joules of energy, probably. But, um, okay, uh, what kind of ejection system does the A-10 have for the GAL-8 main gun? Is it dumped out of the aircraft or spent casings misfired? So it just goes back into the, the drum, is what I hear. Yep, it goes right back into the back side of the drum. Regarding combat damage that is inflicted on the A-10, can you discuss the redundancies of systems in order to keep the aircraft flying, even in a damaged state? I'll make it brief because you could literally go on mm -hmm. all day for this. But basically, you have two hydraulic systems that can cross bleed against each other. You have two reserve hydraulic reservoirs in the nose landing your wheel well with enough hydraulic pressure left in them to lower, manually lower your gears. You have the manual reversion process to allow you to mechanically control your flight controls. Um, and then you also have redundancies in the electrical system. So, like, mm -hmm. for instance, emergency jettison. Uh, the wiring for that goes through two different locations uh, that are very far apart from each other so that you can lose half of that and still have the ability to jettison your weapons, uh, emergency jettison only. Uh, so it's got multiple radios. It's got multiple generators. It has multiple hydraulic pumps. It has, it's got double of everything. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and it can fly with one vertical stabilizer. It doesn't need both. It, it, mm -hmm. can, it can do a lot.
Yeah, I mean, it's designed to be shot at, at the end of the day. I mean, you've got that big heavy bath, and, bathtub thing, haven't you? So, was, yeah. Yes, and it's also not a stressed skin aircraft. So unlike some aircraft, mm-hmm. like on an F-16 or an F-35, you pull a panel off. Oh, you can't tow the airplane now because if you do, it'll snap in half. Mm-hmm. On an A-10, you can take all the panels off and you can tow it around. It won't be a problem. Like it, it you can shoot all the panels off of it you want. Yeah. Uh, leading edges of the wings off and everything. It's it's going to keep flying. It's not going to. The structure is going to hold. And we go back to the beginning to say that this is it was a design philosophy. Uh, this was all you know. You can't just retrofit an F-35 to make it non-stress skin. This is how it was designed. It was designed to be shot at at the end of the day. Correct. Hmm. Okay, very good. Um, can you reuse recovered weapons from crash planes? I wouldn't. Uh, theoretically, yes. If they're not damaged, once they pass the inspections in the bomb dump, they could come back out to you, but I wouldn't want to use those. Because you have to imagine fuses mm. Fuses are impact sensitive. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. Is there another A-10-like aircraft you would like to work on? There is no A-10-like no, aircraft really, in the world. Even that, that frog Russian foot. Frogfoot is mm-hmm. nothing like an A-10. Mm-hmm. If you look at the Frogfoot and look at the YA-9, What's they that? almost look identical. That's the one that failed against the A-10 in competition. Roger. How interesting. Yeah, I mean, they certainly look absolutely nothing alike. In fact, we've got... Uh, Ivan sent me a uh, load of data. We've got a, a S Frogfoot and a Hog comparison video to do. Uh, right, I'm going to quickly blast through the uh, star questions because we did good for time. Have you ever had a ride in a Warhog? No, because there's no two-seater, question mark? There's only two two-seaters. One's on a stick. I think it's in um, the Air Museum at DM or maybe at Nellis. And the other one, I think, crashed and they're gone. Yep. Uh, Not- Roger, 34. Uh, is there a workers' union which prohibits you from working in dangerous materials? <laughs> This is the military. No. <laughs> I was going to say, can you imagine? You'd never get any wars done. What is the sound of the Gow 8 when fired? Brrr! It's just as it is in... in Nailed the, it. Just as it is in the game, right? Correct. Yeah, sounds just like it. Does the gun really go burr? Yes, it does. If so, why does the gun go burr? It's actually interesting. Does it? Because it doesn't really sound like the M61 or stuff like that, does it, guys? I guess it's just that... Profile. It's the rate of fire. Rate of fire, size of shell, all that kind of stuff, I suppose. Interesting. All of the above, you're right. Do you kiss every round you load? No, because it would be a lot. Uh, who would win, Larry Bird or Kingston Kingston? How much freedom do the CBU 105s actually have? Uh, are you allowed to drop CBU 105s? These are the tank killers versions, aren't they? Yeah, so I talked to the author of this question. What he's asking, what he's actually asking is how much freedom do you distribute with CBU 105s? <laughs> Mm-hmm. And uh, <laughs> I would imagine if we ever did use them quite a lot. Mm-hmm. Have, it, have, it, have these things been used in real life, these, these 105s? Do we know? Uh, no, not that I know of. I think the CBU 97s have in 93, mm-hmm. maybe. Or, and no, sorry, in uh, 2003, maybe. Mm-hmm. But um, with out of the B1s. But I don't think so because, we, like I said, we're trying to avoid the mm-hmm. use of, uh, mm-hmm. of those type of things. Yeah, I mean, a serious. So, what was the. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, which one I had the war story for? Did you take uh, Anyone? Wolf? Laser Mavericks. Send. Ah, uh, yes, Laser Mavericks. Finish your question, Kat. Um, uh, it's, just, it's just a CBU 105. I mean, I was, I was going to ask, really, do we think they're as good as they are in game? But if we've never really dropped them, no one's ever going to know. They're so good in game. Like, stupidly good. If you look at the, the test footage of them that they did, uh, they, they, they're good. Yeah. Okay. I haven't, but I would love to. I will do one day. Um, yeah, okay. Um, so if you send your story, and then we'll move into quick fire, and then we'll terminate. Okay, so back in 2016, we're um, flying out of uh, Insulik, Turkey, and we're fighting ISIS. And ISIS had uh, one of their big specialties were vehicle-borne improvised explosive devices, and they were building them um, in the desert, and then they were driving them into Mosul to use against the Kurdish fighters and the Iraqi forces that were coming in to try to retake the city. And Mosul has the, the Tigris River going through it and all these bridges, and they were driving across the bridges, so we started blowing up the bridges. Well, they got smart, and they're like, hey, we can. We, we didn't blow up the spans of the bridges. We made it impossible to get on the bridges. Mm-hmm. So what they did was they started using cranes to pick these things up and put them on the bridge. Mm-hmm. So the, the those kill cell guys were like, hey, can you kill these cranes? Can you kill this crane here? And it was under the bridge. These ISIS guys, they put it under the bridge. Mm-hmm. So one of our pilots, uh, he was like, yeah, I think I can do that. So he self-lazed. He dropped down really, really low so he could hit a line of sight on this thing. 
skimming the the, the the building tops of Mosul, punching out MJU-64s, which are not in DCS, which are covert flares, as he's flying along, uh, lasing this this uh, crane, which he only can see because he's gotten down so low, fires off that laser Maverick, and he has to ride that Maverick. He has to fly behind it until it hits. As soon as it hits, he pulls out, over G's the jet, pulled like five or six G's as he pulled out, but he got the the crane under the bridge with a laser Maverick. That's pretty cool. I wonder, I wonder if he had got any footage of that. I don't suppose he would have it anyway, but that's quite cool. Okay. Um, and because that war, that crane presumably wasn't hot, he couldn't have used an IR fire and forget type Maverick, I guess. Yeah, there had to be a laser Maverick on that one. It was too, too, it was too much in the shadows and everything. Yeah, I guess the... that makes sense. So that's an excellent uh, situation of where you'd have to have that kind of uh, designating uh, uh, and you couldn't use a, a typical type. Okay. Um, very good. Uh, a quick fire, guys. Of course, we've done well for time. Um, questions for Loader? I could talk a little bit more about like weapons flight line and how we work on the flight line and what life is like out there. You send. Okay, so a lot of people don't... I mean, you guys have talked to a whole bunch of really good maintainers and a lot of guys mm-hmm. who had really good stuff, but they haven't really talked about like what life was like, like on the flight line. Mm-hmm. And Cap, if you can bring up those pictures that right. I sent you of like the Maverick load... Um, if you look at that picture of those guys loading the Mavericks, mm-hmm. you can see they're all in like cold weather gear and they're in this, this has in Korea. And uh, what they're doing there is they're trying to load that Maverick and they're doing it kind of wrong, but I don't blame them for what they're doing because they're probably freezing their butt off. It's mm-hmm. Korea. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the nature of the flight lines. You try to get stuff done as fast as you can because you're out in the elements. Um, it's normally an eight, like a on paper, eight hour shift, but you normally end up working 10 to 12 hours. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, that's a three-man load crew. The three-man sits on the jammer. The one and two-man, the two-man preps the rack, and the one-man runs the checklist and helps the two-man out. Um, that's how we organize our load crews. Um, and you said, that's, that's thing, sli- I, you said that slides on the rack? So what you see in that picture um, is um, they're going to load on Station 9. They have a Maverick in its casket. So that's a normal load. Mm. Uh, they're gonna What they're going to do is they're going to drive that Maverick up to that rail. They're going to mm. download the rail from the bomb rack slide it onto the Maverick, lock it into the Maverick, and then load that whole package as a package back up in the bomb rack. Okay. That's how they're going to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's an example of a weapons load. And that's a little time hack that they're doing to save time mm-hmm. rather than dropping the Maverick all the way down and dropping the rail and having to carry it over to the Maverick and slide it on. They're mm-hmm. just going to bring the Maverick right up to it, unlock it, slide it on there, mm-hmm. uh, restrap it down, and then finish the load that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, that's an example of a good weapons load in progress. And then uh, also of the MHU-83, which we use for loading Mavericks. And also that, that MHU-83 is what we use for pulling the gun system parts out, like the drum mm-hmm. and the gun. We have special adapters that allow us to do that. Um, and the other picture with the uh, AMRAMs, you'll see guys with the MJ, MJU-1, mm-hmm. or sorry, the MJ-1, um, officially called the munition, munitions handling truck, but it's, we call them the jammer. And uh, that's the bread and butter jammer that we load all of our bombs mm-hmm. with. Uh, in that picture, they're loading a Maverick, a- or sorry, a, a, a AMRAM, and it's being held by a device called an OSLA, which pins onto the table of the jammer, and then it can cradle the missile. And that OSLA has been in service since the Vietnam War. It, it mm-hmm. still has a setting on it for sparrows. <laughs> that's cool. For AIM sevens. Um, and there's another three man load crew. I think I forget what they're loading in that picture, but. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's uh, that's your average load crew and work. Also, an example of the trailers. So when you know, you know, in DCS, you just go to the menu and you just <laughs> yeah. order up these these bombs and, and mm-hmm. weapons a la carte, and that's not how it works. Um, mm-hmm. You you get what ammo has available for you. Mm-hmm. What's available at their what they call the has, which is the, like the forward location. Um, if they have to go back to the bomb dump to get stuff, it's going to take even longer to get your munitions delivered. And munitions delivery and the timing of that is a huge part of the process. Um, making sure that you get that munition there when the load crew is ready so you're not wasting any time mm-hmm. saves a lot of effort. I mean, the reload time on DCS, <laughs> I know it's a game and nobody would want to play it if it was if no, the reload right. times were realistic. <laughs> Three hours uh, later. <laughs> right. So, that the, you know, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, my mm-hmm. job as, a, as the flight line expediter would be to, I sent them there and gave them a task and I said, hey, load these missiles on this aircraft, these stations, and then they're just going to go execute that with their tech data and their tools. Um, and then tech data and tools, another big part of the process is having all the right stuff available at the right time at the right place and making sure it's not broken. And, all, you know, and, and halfway through that load, that jammer could die. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I've seen it happen. I've seen catastrophic hydraulic failures and all kinds of stuff. Mm-hmm. And then n- now the load's going to take twice as long because you have to call the aerospace ground equipment guys, the age guys, to bring you another one. And mm-hmm. it, so there's a lot that goes into the flight line. Uh, you're working with the crew chiefs and the avionics guys, working around them, deconflicting with them. Hey, can my guys get on this aircraft? No, we're trying to key the radios. Okay, well, how long do you need? And then, you know, the crew chief's like, oh, I'm going to air a tire. You have to back away then you know so there's a lot that goes into the flight line it's just moving chaos it's not as bad as an aircraft carrier flight deck mm. but it's still pretty chaotic sometimes mm. are these little diesel powered vehicles they are diesel powered uh they're hydrostatic drives mm. okay. and the same motors in both of them the big one and the little one have the same motor roger okay interesting they're kind of like glorified um uh, engine cranes really <laughs> i'd love to have this for my car that'd be cool Okay. It it could pick your car up. No way, it could literally three thousand pounds. It says so. Hmm. Um. Okay. So that's that. Um. Any um. Have you ever had any? Uh, I don't know. I don't know what you're allowed to talk about, but I'll prod anyway. Have you had any battle damaged planes, or not even battle damaged, but just damaged like like you said, bird strikes and stuff like that? Have you ever had damaged planes or damaged stores, damaged fuses, stuff like that? Oh yeah, we've had uh. We had lightning strike the ramp and blow out the uh, nose or the uh, the seeker head of an am- of a God, maverick. Could have gone wrong, couldn't we? It? Had uh, in uh, McDill, no, it was Eglin down at Eglin. We had a pelican hit the engine mm-hmm. nacelle pylon and destroy it. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was that took three months to fix. Mm-hmm. Um, we had in 2012. In fact, uh, this pilot got a air medal for this uh, for this mission. Uh, it was the Kunar Valley uh, he was flying in. He came back with battle damage. This is a really interesting story in which uh, weather was terrible. And this, is, this highlights the example of, or highlights the A-10 and what it can really do. The weather was absolutely horrible. Nobody was going to come help these guys. It was a British special ops team supporting Afghan commandos in the Kunar Valley. They, com- they came into an ambush. Uh, they lost their two JTACs right away. They were the first two guys wounded, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the A-10s came in. One was they were both low on gas, so one of them went to go to the tanker, which took forever because of the of the storms and the weather. And the other one stayed on station and started putting down cover fire. Um, this is the one that would come back mm-hmm. later. Uh, it was flown by a, a guy named uh, Zuko. Uh, there's a TV program about this also. Mm-hmm. Uh, he uh, he he fires out his gun and his rockets, but the bad guys are too close to use his bombs. Uh, he came back to Bagram and landed with only 300 pounds of gas left mm-hmm. and two bullet holes in the airplane, mm-hmm. which the airplane didn't lose a sortie. They just they were they were in flight controls. They popped them off the plane, took them to the structural shop, fixed mm-hmm. them, brought them back out, and put them back on the jet, and it flew the next day. Yeah. Um, we reloaded the gun, and he was fine. Um, his wingman finally got off the tanker and came back. I was working end of runway, which is the arm the arm. Uh, so the plane comes to the end of the, to what in that case was the end of our ramp and we'd arm up all the weapons and inspect all the weapons one more time to make sure they were good. The crew chief would make sure that the aircraft was good and then we'd send him on his way. Um, so I recovered him, but his wingman didn't come back. And I thought that was kind of weird. Uh, and I didn't recover his wingman for another few hours cause he stayed out there. Um, not just providing cover fire, but also acting as an airborne fact for additional assets that were being poured in to provide cover. Uh, and I will never forget the radio call. I was on the, I was at a runway and I heard the ops call the pro soup, the production supervisor. He runs the flight line. He's a senior enlisted man who runs the overall flight line and asking, cause we had had several, uh, alert aircraft on our schedule called the CAS alert asking how many of the CAS alert aircraft were available. And the pro soup said all of them. And he said, okay, well I'm stepping pilots to all those jets right now. So they scrambled out all the jets to go out there, and uh, they just blew up everything. The PJs went in, rescued the wounded, and pulled out the uh, special ops team, and then brought them back to the bag room. And then uh, the next day, we gave them brass, or we mm-hmm. call it brass, but the casings from the uh-huh. gun. Awesome. I don't think they're set for it, but are the A-10s carry tactical nuclear? No. <laughs> we don't have nuclear consent so. wiring. Wouldn't be much yeah, of a tactical nuclear, would it? Yeah. Yeah. That would be a one-way trip. Yeah, you couldn't yeah. escape it, could you? Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. You never know these days. Tactical... That'd be worse than A4. 
I mean, they're really hard to 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 do to do proper nuke draw uh, bombing in the MiG twenty one. Uh, the oh god, the F five doesn't have nukes, but it could carry nukes. And did you did the speed and everything you need to get away from that blast is is absolutely phenomenal. Um, okay, guys. Well, first of all, thank you for the loader um, for doing this. It was, you know, amazingly professional as usual, uh, which was awesome. Really good fun. I've learned bloody loads. I know so little about this plane. That was awesome. And um, that's it, really. Just really good, good fun. Um, thank well, you for turning up. Thank you up very loader. much for having me. Yeah. Thank I'm you very all... much for having me, and thanks GR for everything you guys have done over the years. It's been great. Roger, and we'll we'll you know we'll speak in the videos and stuff as we always do. And um, Cool. All right. Well, I'm going to go now. I hope you enjoyed that, guys. And I'll see you a lot later.